Good morning. I'm Fred Kemp, President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation hosted by the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center in partnership with the International Monetary Fund. This morning marks the launch of the IMF's new paper, which dives into the inner workings of central bank digital currencies in six countries and currency unions, and that includes China, Sweden, Uruguay, Canada, the Bahamas, and the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union. Both the event and the IMF's paper could not be more timely or more significant. Last month, the U.S. Federal Reserve announced its intention to explore the creation of a central bank-backed digital dollar. Last week, India surprised many with their plans to have a digital rupee online by 2023. So truly, the race for the future of money is underway. The Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center, under the leadership of Director Josh Lipsky, has been at the forefront of this issue. As cited in this new IMF report, the center's flagship central bank digital currency tracker reveals that 91 countries, representing 90% of global GDP, are exploring issuing their own digital currency. The center's research, writing, and testimony to Congress have helped galvanize action both in the U.S. and abroad. In short, this is important work, and this is an important day in that work. And to mark the occasion, we are honored to welcome back to the Atlantic Council Kristalina, Kristalina Georgieva, the Managing Director of the IMF. Ms. Georgieva is a distinguished public servant and leader. She was previously the CEO of the World Bank and Vice President of the European Commission. She has served as the Managing Director of the IMF since October 2019, and in this role has steered the IMF through COVID-19's enormous economic challenges. Managing Director Georgieva was awarded the Atlantic Council's Distinguished Leadership Award in 2020, our highest honor. Ms. Georgieva, welcome back. After the Managing Director's remarks, Alice Fullwood, finance correspondent for The Economist, will lead a discussion with senior representatives from the IMF and central banks featured in the report. And to conclude, Geoeconomic Center Director Josh Lipsky will outline the ambitious plans ahead for the Atlantic Council's digital currency work. But first, Managing Director Georgieva, Kristalina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, dear Fred, uh, for the introduction. Uh, and uh, many thanks to the Atlantic Council for providing a fitting venue to discuss central banks' forays into digital currencies. Uh, since uh, the founding of the Atlantic Council in 1961, it has made important contributions to strategic, political, and economic policy debates. Those debates have served us well, helping us to test the boundaries of our thinking and be better prepared for, for what lies ahead. Uh, so today we aim to test our thinking again. Uh, we have moved beyond conceptual discussions of uh, CBDCs, and we are now in the face of experimentation. Central banks are rolling up their sleeves and uh, familiarizing themselves with the bits and bytes of digital money. These are still early days for CBDCs. We don't quite know how far, how fast they will do will go, but what we know is that central banks are building capacity to harness new technologies to be ready for what may lie ahead. If CBDCs are designed prudently, they can potentially offer more resilience, more safety, greater availability, and lower costs than private forms of digital money. 
That is clearly the case when compared to unbacked crypto assets that are inherently volatile. And even the better managed and regulated stable coins may not be quite a match against a stable and well-designed central bank digital currency. We know that the move towards CBDCs is gaining momentum. Uh, President Kemp was very clear on that. It is driven by the ingenuity of central banks. Uh, all told, around 100 countries are exploring CBDCs at one level or another. Some researching, some testing, and a few already distributing CBDCs to the public. In the Bahamas, the sand dollar, the local CBDC, has been in circulation for more than a year. Sweden's risk ban has developed a proof of concept and it is exploring the technology and policy implications of CBDCs. In China, the uh, digital uh, renminbi called eCNI continues to progress with more than 100 million individual users and billions of yuans in transactions. And as we heard from Fred just last month, the Federal Reserve issued a report uh, on CBDCs and it noted that a CBDC could fundamentally change the structure of the US financial system. As you might expect, uh, the IMF is deeply involved in this issue, including through providing technical assistance to many members. An important role for the fund is to promote exchange of experience and support the interoperability of CBDCs. As part of the service to our members, today we are publishing a paper that shines a spotlight on the experiences of six central banks at the frontier, uh, including China and Sweden, to be covered in the panel discussion following my remarks. We take away three common lessons from these central banks from which others may benefit. Lesson number one, no one size fits all. There is no universal case for CBDCs because each economy is different. In some cases, a CBDC may be an Im important path to financial inclusion. For instance, when geography is an obstacle to physical banking. In others, a CBDC could provide an essential backup in the event that other payment instruments fail. Uh, one such case was when the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank extended its CBDC pilot to areas struck by a volcanic eruption last year. So central banks should tailor plans to their specific circumstances and needs. Lesson number two, financial stability and privacy considerations are paramount to the design of CBDCs. Central banks are committed to minimizing the impact of CBDCs on financial intermediation and credit provision, very important for the wheels of the economy uh, to run, sm run smoothly. The countries we studied offer CBDCs that are not interest bearing, which makes a CBDC useful, but not as attractive as a vehicle for savings as traditional bank deposits. Uh, we also saw in all three active CBDC projects in the Bahamas, China and Eastern Caribbean Currency Union that they placed limits on holdings of CBDCs, again, to prevent sudden outflows of bank deposits into CBDC. Limits on holdings of CBDCs also helps meet people's desire for privacy while guarding against illicit financial flows. Smaller holdings are allowed without the need for full identification if the risks of money laundering and terrorist financing are low. This could be a boon for financial inclusion at the same time. But larger transactions and holdings require 
more stringent checks as you would expect if you deposit a bag of cash at the bank. Uh, in many countries, privacy concerns are a potential deal breaker when it comes to CBDC le legislation and adoption. So it is vital that policymakers get the mix right. And that brings me to lesson number three, balance. Introducing a CBDC is about finding the delicate balance between developments on the design front and on the policy front. Getting the design right calls for time and resources and continuous learning from experience, including shared experience across countries. And in many cases, this would require close partnerships with private firms to successfully distribute CBDCs, build e-wallets, add features, push the bounds of technology. But the policy aspects are also paramount, including developing new legal frameworks, new regulations, new case law. Uh, on both fronts, uh, CBDC also requires prudent planning to satisfy policy targets like financial inclusion and avoid at the same time undesirable spillovers such as sudden capital outflows that could undermine financial stability. Taken together, careful design and policy considerations will underpin trust in CBDCs. Uh, but let's not forget that trust must be anchored in credible central bank with history of delivering on its mandate. Introducing a CBDC is no substitute for this underlying trust built over decades, a public good that allows money to grease the wheels of our economies. The success of a CBDC, if and when issued, will depend on sufficient trust. And in turn, any successful CBDC should continue to build trust in central banks. Uh, so let me conclude. As we heard from uh, President Kemp, the history of money is entering a new chapter. Countries are seeking to preserve key aspects of their traditional monetary and financial systems while experimenting with new digital forms of money. The paper we are releasing today shows that for those experiments to succeed, policymakers need to deal with many open questions, technical obstacles, policy trade-offs. It may not be easy or straightforward, but I am confident that the bright minds in central banks can succeed thanks to their trademark resourcefulness and perseverance. Uh, fittingly, uh, even the great inventor uh, Thomas Edison acknowledged that there is no substitute for hard work. And this is what we embrace at uh, the IMF. This hard work has already advanced. We are supporting countries in their CBDC experiments to understand big picture trade-offs, to provide technical assistance, to serve as a transmission line of learning and best practice across all our 190 members. And we are stepping up collaboration with other institutions, such as the Bank for International Settlements, at par with the rapidly growing significance of digital money. Today's discussion is only the beginning of an exciting journey, and we have a great panel to take us further on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristalina, uh, for those remarks. I found them very insightful and you have uh, very uh, beautifully summarized um, the paper. I do encourage everyone watching to, uh, to take a look at it as well. Uh, it is my great pleasure now to introduce our panelists. Um, I am delighted to be joined by Mr. Mu Changchun. He is the Director General of the Digital Currency Institute of the People's Bank of China. Uh, welcome, welcome, Mr. Mu. Um, I'm also thrilled to be joined by Mr. Tobias Adrian, the Financial Counselor and Director for the IMF's Monetary and Capital Markets Department. Hello, Tobias. Hello. 
And finally, by Miss Gabriella Geborg, who is the Head of Analysis and Policy at Sweden's Riksbank. Hi, Gabriella. Hello. My name is Alice Forward. I write about Wall Street for The Economist, and I will be moderating uh, today's discussion. Uh, we have just under an hour uh, to talk about the paper with this with our three panelists. Uh, please feel free to ask questions using the Q&A function, and I will try to get some of those at the end. Um, one of the things that fell out of uh, Kristalina's remarks for me was this idea that we've moved from the innovation stage into the experimentation phase. And I guess, you know, the most urgent question to me, it seems, as a journalist, is uh, how close we are to uh, CBDCs really becoming a reality that lots of people are using in their everyday lives. Dozens of countries around the world have uh, begun uh, experimenting with these, as you should be able to see using the Atlantic Council's tracker. So I would like to give our panelists uh, a chance to to give me a sense of how far they think we are from uh, from making CBDCs a reality and um, and what stage their pilots are in. Uh, could I first go to Mr. Moo? Thank you, Alice. Thank you for uh, having me here today. Um, the reason why uh, our uh, CBDC project is still running its pilot phase currently. Uh, you see why pilots have been have been running in 11 areas, including Shenzhen, Suzhou, Qinghuan, Chengdu, Shanghai, Hainan, Changsha, Xi'an, Qingdao, Dalian, and 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics venues. There will be more cities that join ECNY pilots soon. Uh, but now, uh, nine provide, private authorized arbiters have joined the ECNY system, including the ICBC, ABC, Bank of China, BOC, uh, CCB, Bank of Communications, Postal Saving Banks of China, China Merchants Bank, uh, as well as Alipay and Tenpay in the name of their commercial banks arm. With the pilot going on, there will be more qualified private sector operators join the ECNY system. By October 8th of 2021, there were over 123 million ECNY wallets registered uh, with individuals and around 9.2 9 million wallets held by uh, corporate firms. And it's accepted in more than 1.3 million merchants in pilot areas. And uh, we actually feel obliged uh, to start our CBDC due to the following uh, motivations. First, to improve the efficiency of the central bank payment system. In recent years, we have witnessed a trend that a lot of central banks are improving their payment systems by building up faster payment systems, which will widen the access and include more participants from different sectors. Uh, the ECNY project uh, is one of our, our efforts to improve the efficiency of the central bank payment system. We provide 724 services to the general public, which, which, which will greatly extend the service hours. Uh, in addition, our system realizes high, higher efficiency with the feature of settlement up, upon payment. Furthermore, uh, we strengthened uh, the ECMI cap capability. For now, we can support uh, 10,000 TPS. Uh, last but not least, ECMI joins hands with more participants from different sectors, including not only commercial banks and uh, uh, financial uh, market infrastructures, but also uh, pay PSPs, fintech companies, telecom operators, and so on. With the efforts, uh, we managed to increase the efficiency of the central bank payment system. Secondly, uh, in order to uh, provide a backup or redundancy for the retail payment system, we build up this uh, ECMI payment system. As you may know that Alipay and Tenpay seem to have already become significantly important financial infrastructure. If anything bad happened to them, either financially or technically, that will be uh you know will bring very significant negative impact to the financial system is that is the case when alipay and tempe are not allowed 
inside the Winter Olympics venues due to the business privilege privilege of the Olympic sponsors because the Visa is the only one who can provide the mobile service, mobile payment services inside of the Olympic Olympics venues. But since ECNY has the legal tender status, it's no doubt available uh, in the Winter Olympic venues and further offers various kinds of wallets for the audience and all athletes to take a dip into the convenience of the mobile payments in China. It is the same in other pilot cities when see ECNY can offer a backup in extreme scenarios like a connectivity and a power shortage. Last but not least, to improve the financial inclusion. The private sector provide financial services that cover 80% of the population, while remaining 10 to 20% are dis- disadvantaged in their access to the basic banking services. In addition, as mobile payments are so prevalent in China, foreign short-term foreign visitors and the non-residents may also have difficulties may- in making payments in China because most of the merchants don't accept accept the tech, cash, paper notes, credit cards, or debit cards. So it will be the obligation or responsibility for the central bank to cover those uh, long-tail users. First, as ECNY is loosely coupled with bank account system, digital wallets could be opened without the support of a traditional banking uh, account, sy- account system. On one hand, the d- disadvantage people can jo- enjoy the uh, basic financial services. On the other hand, the foreign short-term foreign visitors and non-residents can enjoy the mobile payment system in China. Moreover, ECNY charge no fee from the authorized arbiters and the individual users. It will reduce the burden of the real economy and improve the business business environment. Uh, I will stop here. Back to you, Alice. Um, thank you for that. That was um, uh, very helpful in, in clarifying, you know, where you're at with your CBDC and what your goals are. Um, can I put a similar question uh, to Gabriella? Um, the Rix Bank was also sort of at the forefront of exploring CBDCs, but it hasn't yet quite launched a pilot. Um, what's holding you back? Uh, how, how do you anticipate sort of uh, proceeding with your CBDC soon? And what goals are you hopeful to achieve with a with the CBDC? Well, let's start with the background, why we were, thank you, Alice, uh, for the question. Um, let, let me start with the background, why we were at the forefront. It's not that we were wiser than other central banks. Uh, it's more like the future, as Mrs. Uh, Georgieva was talking about, came to us a little bit earlier. Uh, we became fully digitalized, almost fully digitalized, very early. Uh, Cash almost disappeared, uh, was completely marginalized in Sweden in the last 10 years. Uh, So then as a central bank, with our role of uh, providing um, the population with um, uh, central bank currency, we began to think, well, is the people abandoning cash because they don't feel that they need uh, the, the, the trust given by the central bank in providing the, the unit of account, the currency? Or is it that the technology is uh, not really fit for purpose in this new digital uh, environment? Sweden is a very digitalized uh, country, as I said before. And for example, we even have our um, transactions and, and um, activities with authorities uh, digitally nowadays. Um, so the answer to that question, so the, we began to think about the what, uh, what do we need to do uh, and how. So we, we did a lot of um, policy analysis on what a central bank digital currency would look like uh, at a very, very high conceptual level uh, and what the policy implications in terms of the central bank's other mandates on monetary policy and financial stability could possibly uh, be. But we understood also very early on that this 
decision, the decision of uh, launching a central bank digital currency was something that was a, a very, very big step. Uh, a step that could not be a decision, at least, that could not be taken by the central bank by itself or alone. It needed to have um, a, a, a broad uh, discussion with stakeholders and with national authorities and with politicians. We needed to, to, to get the support of the whole society in order to do that. Uh, so we asked the parliament, the Swedish parliament, to start an inquiry. Uh, and the inquiry was broad. It was not only about um, whether the Riks Bank should launch or not a CBDC, uh, but also what is the state or what is the role of the state vis-a-vis -vis the private sector in the payments market um, in, in a completely or a very, very um, exceedingly digitalized society. And within that broad scope, uh, whether the Riks Bank uh, should be allowed uh, to issue um, a CBDC. And in that case, uh, what the legal status of the CBDC would be, legal tender or what. Um, and this inquiry started at the end of 2020, uh, and we are expecting the result in, in simplifying the whole thing. We are expecting whether we get, have the green light or not. Uh, and we expect the result from this inquiry at November, in November this year. Uh, but at the same time, we are not sitting uh, with crossed arms waiting for the result, but we continue working. Uh, and it's not that we have go gone from the conceptual level to the experimental level. We are doing both uh, because there is a, a, a need of an interaction uh, between the policy analysis uh, and the lessons that we draw from learning from technology and the other way around uh, so the pilot that you mentioned, we, we do have a pilot, um, and, and it started in 2020. The pilot is by no means a blueprint for how uh, potentially Kruna, that's the name for our CBDC, would look like. Uh, the pilot is a pilot with a Accenture, and it's a DLT-based model. Uh, in the beginning was a proof of concept uh, with demos for, for you know, uh, user tools and, and so on. Uh, the second phase of the pilot integrated some uh, stakeholders, uh, one bank, one big bank and one fintech company, uh, and also some point of sale um, interaction. Uh, and in that second phase, we also looked into some issues of um, offline, for example. Uh, and now we are starting to uh, think, this is, as I said, this pilot is not, if we decide that we're going to launch an Incruna, given that we have the political support to do so, uh, we are not going to say, well, then we continue with this pilot with Accenture. Uh, this pilot was for us to learn, draw lessons from the technology used. At the same time that we continue with the policy analysis and see what can the technology provide what is not there in terms of uh, resilience, in terms of, of for example, like offline uh, capabilities, in terms of scalability, efficiency. Uh, and uh, so when we go further during this year, we need to decide more of the details of uh, the requirements uh, for uh, the tender that is needed in case we decide to launch an ICUNA. So we are going to go to the blueprint, the design this year. Uh, and very much and very important here is the international uh, work that we are doing. We are working very much in cooperation with other central banks, as you very well know, in the G7 central bank group with the BIS. Uh, we have been working with the G7 last year on this subject. Um, and we are also working in a very, very, very important aspect of cross-border capabilities of CBDC within, uh, within the uh, roadmap, uh, roadmap by the G20 uh, and the, under the, chairs, chair, uh, the chair in this group is uh, Mrs. Hilda Kingsley, who is the first deputy governor of the Riks Bank. Uh, and we need to have all these pieces to make the puzzle. Uh, what are other central banks uh, or the central bank community converging into in terms of 
uh, what is needed, uh, what are we thinking ourselves, and what lessons are we drawing from the foreign pilots before we go ahead. And most importantly of all, we need the go ahead. So as a, as a journalist, I expect that you want me to give you um, a year, but you won't have a scope scope from me. Uh, I, I cannot say, but uh, at least this year we are going to have the answer from the politicians. And then we will know. Well, that's definitive enough for me uh, for now. I won't ask you to pin down a, an exact year that, that you'll launch. Um, moving on to uh, to bias, you get to look at all different kinds of countries, uh, pilot projects and uh, all kinds of goals. Could you, and, and all the goals that they're attempting to achieve with those CBDCs. Um, is there sort of a commonality that you think is driving most people? You heard sort of Gabriella and, and Mr. Mu talk about um, the sort of digitization of payments. And how far do you think we are from people really thinking that CBDCs are a, are a technology that we're actually using and we've sort of moved beyond that experimentation phase? Yeah, thanks so much, Alice. Um, um, as uh, Kristalina Georgieva uh, mentioned at the beginning, uh, there are now over 100 countries around the world that are either studying CBDCs or have introduced CBDCs. Uh, in fact, uh, there's, uh, uh, there are two countries in the world right now uh, that have uh, launched their CBDCs. Uh, one is the Bahamas. The Bahamas was the very first country in the world to launch a CBDC. Uh, and the other one is uh, Nigeria that launched uh, just last year. Um, but as, as I mentioned, there are you know, over 100 countries that are exploring or experimenting with CBDCs. Um, the paper that we are launching uh, today that uh, was uh, led by an IMF economist, Gabriel Soderberg, uh, is looking specifically at six countries, including China and Sweden uh, that we just heard from, but also the Bahamas, which I just mentioned, the Eastern Caribbean uh, Currency uh, Union, ECCB, uh, as well as uh, Canada and Uruguay. Um, and so let me, let me uh, share a little bit uh, the motivations uh, of those uh, various countries. Um, I think the, the prime motivation at the moment is the technological change that we are seeing in payment space. Um, there are new technologies, and those provide offer opportunities for countries to run more efficient payment systems. So this is the deep uh, cause why it's happening at the moment. And clearly, in the world around us, we are seeing a lot of innovation in the financial sector, you know, which is broadly called fintech. And so countries are aiming uh, to increase efficiency in the payment system. Uh, of course, uh, as was mentioned already, trust is at the root of any payment system. So having a payment system that is trustworthy and having a CBDC that is trustworthy is uh, the prime goal of everybody. So you want it to be more efficient, but you want it to be trustworthy. And so what does that mean? It has to be resilient. It has to be resilient against many risks. And here, the Bahamas and uh, the ECCB are particularly interesting because, of course, these are countries that are uh, islands in the Caribbean uh, that are often hit uh, by hurricanes. And during those times, cash distribution is extremely difficult. So one of the motivations that is specific to uh, island countries is to be resilient relative to hurricanes in terms of cash distribution. Uh, but of course, there are many other uh, arguments, uh, such as Gabriela, who mentioned that the cash usage in Sweden declined dramatically, and we see similar trends in many other countries. So everybody is moving to a digital world, and it's very natural for the central bank to also uh, move uh, to be digital. Um, and of course, an, an, another important motivation is financial inclusion and access. Uh, in too many countries around the world, uh, we continue to see a fraction of the population that doesn't have access uh, to financial services, that doesn't have access to electronic payments, 
or if it has access, those might be very expensive. And so CBDCs can provide more inclusion and more access to a broader uh, segment of the population. You, de you do need to have a cell phone, or at least you need to know somebody that has a cell phone in order to participate. But that is a very, very large uh, fraction of, uh, of the population. And then uh, lastly, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, as economists, we believe in competition. And uh, a, a, a CBDC, of course, also increases competition in payment space. Uh, and if it's well designed, it's both resilient and competitive uh, so that uh, efficiency is increased. So I think those are broadly the motivations that are shared across countries with, of course, some uh, differentiation across countries as to you know, what is the prime uh, objective relative uh, in one country relative to another. Uh, thank you, no, that's very clarifying. Um, I'd like to just quickly follow up with, uh, with Chang Chun on what it is um, that the People's Bank of China would consider a success relative to the goals that you've laid out. So you, you already say you have 123 million people using the ECNY, uh, that's about sort of 10% of, of the population. You know, what kind of coverage would you need to feel like you'd been successful in the goals of protecting your, your monetary system from potential failure of one of the payments giants and those financial inclusion goals? I think you might be on me, Thank by you. the way. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Alice. Uh, well, actually, uh, the ECNY trials has, have been running very smoothly uh, with increased ac acceptance uh, by the general public. Um, because we adopted the, you know, various kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, marketing campaigns like uh, red packets and low carbon engagement, which has have, have greatly encouraged citizens to use ECNY. Um, uh, just to give you a rough idea that uh, just in the event held by Meituan, which is a O2O platform, uh, they offered uh, Eastern Wild Rail Packets to encourage users to ride bikes and to take public transportation and to reduce carbon uh, emission. Uh, there are already more than 9 million users registered to, uh, in that uh, event. And uh, it's also the same in other events and uh, definitely beyond our expectations. Uh, but uh, we actually uh, seek to maintain a level playing field and build an ecosystem for ECNY, not to reduce the usage of existing payment vehicles, pay, payment uh, digital wallets, such as Alipay and Tempe. So firstly, uh, the usage of uh, ECNY does, does not threat, threaten the market share of Alipay and Tempe. The two firms, as I mentioned in the last question, uh, has, has, have already joined the ECNY ecosystem at the second tier authorized arbiters. And now users could use Scan to pay on TenPay to make ECNY payments and that still be their own market share. Just So their market share will not be reduced and we would not be uh, negatively impact, impacted. Furthermore, Alipay and TenPay works as a wallet and the ECNY works act as the currency or the payment instruments. So will provide a new cases for user cases for them, which will help them to innovate their business. While in the long run, it will be a market-driven house race. Commercial banks or traditional incumbent financial institutions will have a new start given, their, given that they, they could uh, provide better services with ECNY than before. Then they can get back some market share from, the, from Alipay and Tempay. So as to also, um, so there, there's, there's no uh, one uh, main goal for us to uh, achieve to safeguard or diversify the payments because Alipay and, and Tempay, or you call it WePay, they, they are already in the ecosystem. So in terms of uh, monetary sovereignty, as I mentioned above, is the mandate of the central bank to ensure the public direct access to the central bank money. Our pilots 
have already enabled the general public to have a wider and a steady access to the fiat currency, thus to help realize that goal. So, uh, I mean, uh, that goals are already achieved with the trials. Back to you, uh, Alice. Uh, thank you. That's very that's very helpful. Um, just just very quickly, uh, you have your own app as well as interoperating with with WePay and um, Alipay, right? So, do, do you want your own app to become the one that people use with the CBDC, or, or do you not really mind either way? Uh, actually, I, I, we we don't mind because our the market position of our app is not to compete with Alipay and Tempay. It's only a, a manage, management software. People to use that app to manage the uh, or or configure their their uh, payment instruments. Like uh, they can uh, they can manage the the caps uh, in in different use cases. For example, to prevent any tele fraud, they can reduce the cap or the, the, the limit or in one use cases and then and uplift uh, uplift in the another use cases. It's to the goal of that app is to manage or make configurations of their payments instruments. It's not to compete with the all those uh, market uh, you know players. So in the end or in the long run, I, I mean this app will actually go back to the stage, uh, to the backstage, instead of uh, being the players in the field. Uh, yes, thank you for clarifying uh, on that point. Um, okay, we've talked a little bit about, about goals and where all of you are at with your pilots and experimentation phases. Um, now we get to move on to, uh, to some of the risks associated with uh, rolling out these uh, CBDCs. Um, can I go to, to to bias first? Um, in the IMF report, you know, as uh, Kristalina uh, laid out, a lot of the CBDCs that have been launched have caps on balances and also don't pay interest. And those are sort of defensive features to prevent um, undermining the the sort of bank deposit system um, in a lot of countries. Could you just explain? How important that is, and you know, is that the biggest risk associated with CBDCs? Do you think those design features solve it? Um, yes, and yes. <laughs> so, I think uh, this is certainly a significant risk that uh, central banks are, are considering very carefully. Um, um, so, the credit intermediation by the banking system is vital for economies to grow. And uh, of course, banks take deposits that are then transformed into loans to corporates and households. Um, and so by introducing a CBDC, uh, you uh, don't want a significant drainage of deposits out of the banks into the CBDC. There will be some of that, but it has to be within bounds. And so there are really three risks uh, that uh, central banks are concerned about. So the first one is that there is sort of like a structural shift away from bank deposits into CBDCs uh, and what the magnitude of that shift is. And so uh, offering uh, zero interest rates or perhaps in the euro area or some countries uh, with negative interest rates, these might even be negative interest rates on the CBDC, uh, that make... Uh, holding CBDC relatively unattractive to deposits because, of course, commercial banks can offer interest rates on their deposits. Uh, and so that should contain the structural shift of liabilities out of the banking system. Uh, a second concern is, is bank runs, right? So if there's a confidence crisis, and in particular, is if there's a crisis in the confidence of banks, there could be a sudden outflow uh, from banking liabilities into CBDCs uh, because CBDCs, of course, are the liability of the central bank. So they would be uh, considered as being very trustworthy. And um, so this is why uh, many countries are imposing limits on how much uh, CBDC any individual uh, can own or how many, how big the transactions can be. There are different design features in different countries. And then the third risk is uh, for, uh, particularly for emerging markets, 
uh, in developing economies, um, that there could be a flight from domestic currency into foreign CBDC. Because, uh, so that's a kind of like form of electronic dollarization, right? So dollarization has always been a struggle uh, for countries uh, that are viewed as being unstable. But of course, once you go to a fully digital world, uh, that kind of uh, dollarization or, or cryptoization or CBDization could be that much uh, that much quicker and 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 uh, more dangerous. Um, so that's a third consideration. And here, uh, the only tools that policymakers have are are very dramatic. So these are capital flow measures. So these are measures to basically contain the degree to which you can take. Uh, money into foreign CBDCs. So let me stop here and turn back to Alice. Uh, yes, no, that was all. I mean, I was going to say clarifying, but also scary. All of uh, all of the risks uh, you describe. Um, Gabriella, could you could you tell me sort of which of those um, sort of most concerns the risk bank, um, and do you take heart in the uh, in the findings of the paper that uh, that that suggests that there are technical solutions to some of those issues? Well, yes, those that um, uh, Tobias uh, was talking about, of course, are um, one of the main risks, and he uh, described them very, very, very well. Uh, and we have been analyzing those risks from the beginning, uh, and we continue to do so. Uh, the jury is still out in terms of design. What type of control mechanisms uh, are needed, whether uh, quantity li limits or uh, pricing, uh, interest rates, uh, something will be needed. That's my opinion. Uh, let me clarify, this is not the Riggs Bank official uh, point of view, because we don't have an official point of view as yet, uh, but I am the one leading the policy analysis and participating in the international work, So, but it's not the Riggs Bank official point of view. So, of course, those are uh, important risks. Um, and uh, we, we have analyzed um, those risks also in the international uh, cooperation sphere. Um, at the end of last year, I don't remember, it was October or November, uh, the group of seven central banks and the BAS uh, published three reports, one of those was on um, financial stability aspects uh, of CBDCs. And um, I, I think uh, our, the report is very readable and uh, interesting. And we continue within the Riggs Bank uh, to analyze different scenarios uh, of um, demand for CBDCs in normal times and uh, bank runs and what kind of mechanisms we need to have in place. Um, and also what kind of collateral the Riggs Bank would need to have or accept uh, in order to be able to contain uh, a crisis scenario with a lack of confidence in the bank system and, uh, and a very large flow um, of um, CBDCs to the Riggs Bank, whether the Riggs Bank should have to lend the banks. So we are analyzing all these aspects. Um, the, the, the conclusion of the report that I mentioned is that those risks are there uh, and they have to be taken seriously and analyzed very carefully in every jurisdiction, uh, but they are manageable. Uh, and uh, I think that's um, really the Riggs Bank's position uh, right now. Another risk that we see that haven't been mentioned, uh, and this is in particular for jurisdictions that already have very advanced and very efficient payment systems, uh, like Sweden and the Nordics in general. Uh, and the payment market is, as you know, a payment with large network effects and economies of scale, and where we have large incumbents. Uh, so there is also a risk of, um, uh, for the Riggs Bank or a central bank to launch and to fail. Uh, mm -hmm. And that would not be a desirable outcome. So we need also to see uh, that there are user cases for, for, for the CBDC. Uh, we have to have consultations and uh, discussions with all the uh, stakeholders, as most central banks already have converged to the idea 
uh, that we are not going to have a centralized model where the central bank would do everything, but we would have a two-tiered model uh, where the central bank would provide kind of a the, the, the platform on which uh, payment service providers would uh, connect to payment service providers themselves offer service and innovate and compete with each other. Uh, but in that case, we also need to have incentives for payment service providers uh, to adopt and want to uh, the CBDC platform uh, and to want to uh, provide services to end users. Uh, so those there is a very delicate balance here uh, between having something that is too large and that can be dangerous for the financial system and something that really does not take up. Um, so uh, this is complicated and uh, if we are not moving uh, uh, forward uh, fast enough, uh, it's because we need to consider all these aspects before we launch. Yes, I totally understand. Um, that, that makes sense. Um, can I ask um, Tang Chen, China is one of the countries that has launched uh, its pilot CBDC with a quantitative restriction. So there's a, a total cap on the, the balances that you could hold. Um, do you think it's sort of feasible for those caps to always be maintained? You know, if there were a, a bank run or some kind of financial crisis and the Chinese public were clamoring to hold more balances in the CBDC wallets, uh, do you think it would be politically feasible for those restrictions to be maintained? Thank you, Alice. I think the answer, a simple answer to those questions will be yes. We, uh, that uh, the ECNY will not have any uh, material impact, negative impact on the current financial system. And we are confident and uh, we, I, we don't expect in the stress uh, scenario that uh, will be politically, uh, uh, you know, uh, to uh, move from our, our uh, uh, you know, to remove, remove those caps. Because, uh, you know, firstly, the East and White is operated under, under a two-tier system, as mentioned by uh, Gabriela, that uh, the commercial banks are still kept in the loop. And uh, we, as uh, Tobias uh, have said, that uh, we uh, adopt the policy that we mainly position as M0 and pay no interest. We also introduce, we could also in introduce potential fee to charge with a large amount of uh, or frequent withdrawal from the ECNY system during the uh, distress or stressful scenarios. And uh, uh, most importantly, uh, we have the deposit insurance mechanis mechanism in place, which will protect the deposit below RMB 500,000. So for, for those general public, even in a distress or stressful scenario, the general public will have, will, will have no incentive to move their large chunk of their deposit from the financial intermediaries or financial institutions to the ECNY system. And uh, uh, furthermore, in the financial crisis, like uh, Tobias have, have said just now, it will be a run on the whole financial system. It will be a run on the whole sovereign, uh, sovereign monetary system instead of individual financial institutions. So uh, uh, to sum summarize that will not, will, there is no, uh, you know, uh, we will not uh, remove politically. We don't have the pressure uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to move, remove those restrictions. And uh, just to give you a rough idea that uh, currently, uh, with our trials, um, the wallet balance um, is only about RMB four seventy million, comparing with our. M0, which is RMB 8.6 trillion, M1, RMB 62.6 trillion, and M2, RMB 233.6 trillion. You can see the balance, the wallet balance of ESNY is only counted, 
kind of very small percentage of those financial data, financial uh, monetary supply. So I personally am very confident we can guarantee or we can safeguard the those restrictions restrictions even in a very difficult situations. Back to you, Alice. I can see that Gabriella wishes to respond. So, uh, uh, is there anything you'd like to add? Yes, two points, um, and um, related to what um, Chan Chung was saying. Um, at sometimes, uh, particularly com- the arguments coming from from the incumbents, from the banks, um, these um, financial stability risks are a little bit exaggerated. Um, we have in Sweden right now um, currency in circulation to GDP is one percent. Uh, it used to be ten percent fifty years ago. It's still ten percent in the euro area. Uh, assuming, um, which is a large number, we don't have any goal there, assuming that we would have CBDC usage uh, corresponding to 10% uh, of GDP, uh, this doesn't seem to have disintermediated the banks in the euro area. Uh, In Japan, currency in circulation to GDP is 20%, something like that. Uh, So sometimes we are putting too much emphasis. This is not saying that we don't have to analyze this carefully and of course we need to have uh, control mechanisms in place. Uh, That's what I want to say. And also referring to the report that I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the BIS and the group of seven central banks uh, report from last year, something that we point out is that the financial system is being transformed as we speak. Uh, There are not only risks coming from CBDCs, there are risks coming from private money. Uh, As uh, Ms. Uh, Georgieva was um, mentioning in the beginning of this uh, debate, uh, coming from stable coins and uh, bitcoins and um, you name it. Uh, So there there is a very, very rapid transformation in terms of digitalization and the bank's models will have to adapt. Uh, but of course, being as we are central banks, we are going to take this in a very responsible way and a very cautious way. But the risks are already there. Uh, I can see that Tobias wants to add something as well. Um, and then I will go to all audience questions, I promise. I can see that you've been sending them in. So Tobias, uh, what do you want to add? Yeah, just very quickly. I just want to concur with both uh, Gabriela and uh, Mu Chang Chung as well. Uh, in pointing out that, um, um, you know, in financial crisis, in advanced economies, you typically see deposit inflows. Um, So you don't uh, usually see deposit outflows. You do see deposit outflows sometimes in uh, countries with severe banking crisis. But in those countries, um, and these are typically emerging markets or developing economies, and in those countries, uh, typically, it's the entire macroeconomy that is destabilized. And um, of course, uh, CBDC, as, as Gabriela just pointed out, CBDC is one way to make sure that the monetary system in the country is trustworthy. So that should actually mitigate this okay. uh, uh, pressure in crisis for uh, uh, dollarization or cryptoization. Um, so a priori CBDC can actually help uh, to to lean against uh, the macroeconomic uh, outflow of uh, of savings. Let me turn back to Alice. Uh, thank you. No, I I feel reassured by uh, by all of your answers. Um, getting a lot of questions in the chat uh, about you know that. People understand that uh, designing CBDCs and ensuring that they they work as intended um, is a is a is a big task. But at the same time, uh, lots of other innovation is going on: decentralized finance, Web three innovations, stable coins, uh, crypto, etc. Um, you know, is is there a sense that the ground is is slipping under your feet as you try to develop these? And how do you think about how? those might make it more difficult uh, for a central bank digital currency uh, to, to to take hold. Um, I'm not sure who wants to tackle that first. I think uh, it was, 
Oh, Tobias has put his hand up, so uh, I'll go to him first. <laughs> you go. I'm very happy to. We we are, we have been doing a lot of work on on precisely uh, this question. Um, so, in many countries, you see, you know, a fairly sizable um, shift of investments into cryptocurrencies, uh, which, as central bankers, we usually call them crypto assets because we don't want to confuse crypto assets with currencies. Um, so crypto assets, so unbacked uh, crypto, uh, such as Bitcoin or Ethereum, uh, is highly risky and very volatile. And it does not fulfill the criteria of money. Uh, so money is a unit of account, a store of value, and a medium of exchange. And, um, you know, crypto uh, uh, doesn't really fulfill that because it is so volatile. And it's not generally accepted, uh, and it's not that cheap to transact. Um, so, on the other hand, CBDC is a liability of the central bank. Uh, it is the legal tender in those countries that pass CBDCs usually, and uh, it fulfills all the criteria for money. So, it is a very different animal. Now, as you point out, Alice, uh, there are um, backed crypto assets which are generally called stable coins and some of those stable coins do have very safe reserves so some of them hold cash or hold deposits as reserves so they do have fairly stable value while other so-called stable coins are not all that stable they actually fluctuate in value quite a bit so there's a variance across the stable coins but it is certainly true that Stablecoins are more money-like in that they are backed to some degree, at least, uh, or sometimes fully, with cash-like uh, backing. Now, having said that, um, the power of crypto and stablecoins and DeFi is DLT, right? Is uh, distributed ledger technology, which is quite powerful. And uh, when we look around the world, and this is documented in the paper that we're launching today, um, many of the pilots do use DLT technology. So they're not per se crypto assets, but they do use certain aspects of this technology. Not all do that, but many do that because it is a very uh, parsimonious and very powerful uh, technology to use. So at least some of these uh, crypto, uh, some of the, sorry, CBDCs, interact quite closely with the crypto universe technologically, but there's some, some variance around there. But certainly you're you are right in pointing out that for many countries, introducing CBDC is to some degree also defensive uh, in terms of making sure that the central bank is in control of the emerging uh, digital uh, money world. Can I just follow up on uh, that sort of question of the extent to which central banks are using distributed ledger technology? Um, we're getting a lot of questions in the chat about whether or not China is using uh, DLT technology. So, uh, Chang Chun, could you just walk us through uh, how China has rolled its uh, its pilot out? Well, actually, uh, DLT um, is not the single uh, technology we are using. Actually, uh, no single technology is panacea to solve every problem. And uh, as to DLT in terms of, uh, you know, the CBDC uh, development is actually uh, the scalability issue, the, uh, the uh, storage issue is, uh, you know, um, is kind of uh, um, difficult to overcome in this system. So uh, we do not worship any single technology. We are more practical in this sense. So we call it our uh, strategy is long-term evolution. We borrow that idea from the telecom, up, te telecom sector. Um, any technology could accommodate or could uh, be suitable for appropriate for our CBDC system we'll, we'll use. And the DLT definitely is not the single answer or perfect answer to our ECNY system. So for the, uh, the we have two tier system. For the second tier, uh, the, the retail transactions processing, we actually do not use DLT in that, in that uh, tier. 
and uh, uh, we use the centralized system for the retail process, retail transactions processing. And uh, for the uh, first year, we use uh, DLT for the reconciliation uh, process. So, uh, and also we, we borrow some ideas from the crypto assets sets, such as the tokens, uh, the value system, and uh, the smart contracts, but uh, we don't use them all actually in the, our for our whole system. Uh, we are more a hybrid system and we are more practical in this sense. So we call it a uh, hybrid long-term evolution system, not a DLT or DeFi system. Thank you. Back to you, Alice. Thanks. Uh, I can see Gabriella uh, is keen to come back on this. We're also getting lots of questions about whether Sweden is going to use uh, DLT as well. So, uh, uh, Gabriella, what is what is Sweden doing? Thank you, Alice. I, I, I wanted to ask a clarification question to, to uh, Chan Chun first, if I may. Okay. Uh, yes, go ahead. Did I, yeah. Did I interpret you correctly, uh, Chan Chun, that we will have the core uh, of the, the platform provided by the, the People Bank of China will be DLT based and it will be interoperable uh, with the payment service uh, providers own systems so that they can continue to provide um, um, the end users with, with, with legacy systems. Is, is that the interpretation is that interpretation correct? Well, uh, the, uh, I can interpret that uh, more like a hybrid system, not a core with a DLT system. Uh, for the DLT part, we only use DLT technology in the reconcil reconciliation part for our system. That means for the reconciliation, for the uh, you know uh, error correcting uh, that part, all the participants or all the authorized operators, they can use the DLT to, you know, to reconcile uh, at the end of days, uh, at the end, end of business days, and uh, correct all the errors. But for the the core, I mean, retail transaction processing, that part we use a centralized system, actually a traditional uh, uh, centralized system, not a DLT system. Thank you. Uh, and, and back to you, Alice. You, you asked what uh, Sweden is uh, in, whether Sweden is intending to use DLT or not. Is that correct? Yes. Is that uh, well, as I said before, we are complete technology agnostic. Um, so the pilot that we have been having uh, is DLT based, uh, but that does not mean that we are married to DLT. Uh, we have been drawing lessons on the capabilities, um, efficiency enhancement possibilities, and limitations. Scalability is actually one issue. Um, so it's not decided. Uh, and in this sense, we are also looking very closely to what other central banks are doing, uh, because one aspect that is very important, although all central banks are coming to the CBDC from a domestic perspective, uh, so we have to be aware of the risk of every jurisdiction having their own CBDC silo uh, that cannot talk well, with CBDC from other jurisdictions. It's very important that we have the cross-border uh, aspect, cross-currency aspect in mind when we uh, design our CBDC. So it's not only the domestic aspect and it's not technology oriented, it's policy issues that are uh, leading the way and technology have to provide. and it's, possible. I think that what Chan Chun said is very reasonable, that you cannot use one uh, technology alone, uh, that you will have to, to, to accommodate for different technologies and also be flexible because the future, you don't know what uh, it um, awaits uh, and technology is changing very much. So we need to be, whatever we do, we need to have a flexible approach so we can make amends or changes as time goes by. Um, so yeah. no, no, no decision on DLT, summarizing. Very, uh, very clear. No uh, technology agnostic thus far, but uh, but you'll, you'll um, make a decision at some point. Um, 
Am I right in thinking the sort of main advantages for central banks of using distributed ledger technology are that they might make the sort of core system resilient? You know, say there was a a, 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 a tech attack on, on sort of one node, you wouldn't take down the entire network. And that sort of resilience is very appealing to central banks. But then the problems, I guess, are, are with are with scale. Is 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 that the, the sort of general uh, sense of the trade-offs um, that you're hearing? I was going to direct that to Tobias, um, as I, I believe you're plugged into many central banks. Yes, absolutely. Uh, very happy to, to answer that. So um, as, uh, as was pointed out for both China and Sweden, um, typically central banks customize uh, technologies a lot. So uh, typically they would not use uh, a DLT as it's used in, in Bitcoin, but what is called a permissioned uh, a blockchain. So that means that the central bank uh, has a central node um, and that it's using the powerful ledger technology, but uh, that there's an ability of the central bank to understand uh, who's doing what with the currency. Uh, because of course, one of the challenges for central banks is what is called financial integrity. So it's the usage of its currency for criminal and, and terrorist uh, financing, money laundering, et cetera. And so typically central banks will want to have some understanding and some ability for law enforcement to come in and, um, and track who is doing what. So in a fully decentralized system, you can't, Either you can't do it or you can't, you know, I, I mean, there, there are different ways of, of doing this. And so a permission system is typically what, what is being used. Now, of course, that raises privacy concerns, which is something we haven't talked about yet, right? Because as a central bank, you don't want to be able to know who is doing what in every transaction. Citizens don't like that at all. So there has to be some wall. But on the other hand, you have to do the law enforcement because you don't want your currency to suddenly be used, you know, for things you don't want it to be used. So these are very, very um, uh, stark policy trade-offs where the technology is, um, you know, offering solutions to the policy, but there's no one size fit all for every country, um, you know, the Bahamas, which has a working digital uh, central bank digital currency, is using DLT as is ECCU, but many other countries are either not using it or are using some sort of variant, uh, such as a, a permission blockchain. So, so I think um, I, I would agree that you know, it's not the technology that should be driving the CBDC; it's the policy framework, and. Um, you know, the policy objectives that should be driving the technology. And then, um, you know, how, how that ends up uh, depends on the country. But interoperability across borders, of course, is very important. And, um, you know, this work under the, uh, under the framework of the FSB on cross-border payments, in particular, there's one working group, 19, which is about the cross-border interlinkages of CBDCs. And interoperability is extremely key to get to a global financial system and a global monetary system that is going to be smooth and interoperable while being safe. So, you know, the complexity is, is very high. Uh, and that is why we see some progress, but we also see a lot of thinking uh, uh, all around the world. And everybody is watching everybody else to learn from, uh, you know, what you see out there. Yes, we're getting a lot of questions about cross-border payments and interoperability of CBDCs. Um, I'm going to put one quick one to, uh, to Chang Chun first, um, which asks whether the PBOC is exploring uh, an ECNY in Hong Kong in particular that might allow people who live there to get ECNY wallets. Uh, is that something you're, you're looking at? Uh, yes, uh, but, uh, you know, the ECNY project is uh, carried out primarily out of domestic considerations. So we focus on the, uh, the domestic retail sector because we positioned as ECNY as M0, which we which actually mainly used in the domestic retail market. But of course, we in response uh, to the 
uh, initiative of G20, we also explore uh, that whole CBDC such as uh, ECNY can be used to enhance the uh, cross-border payments. In this process, we have uh, uh, exploring the possibilities with the Hong Kong MA in terms of uh, to uh, have an interoperability of with ECNY, uh, between ECNY and the fast payment system of Hong Kong uh, to see whether we can uh, uh, speed up or solve the trilemma of the cross-border payment issues. But of course, during, in that process, we uh, introduce the principle of new uh, no disruption, which is uh, similar to the do no harm principle and the compliance inter interoperability uh, principles in in this uh, in in our in our research uh, for the de no disruption. We think the uh, CBDC supplied by, by one central bank should not should continue to support the healthy evolution of the international monetary system and uh, should not disrupt other central banks' currency sovereignty and their ability to fulfill the mandate for monetary and uh, financial stability. Um, and the second compliance, we have to comply with the uh, local uh, regulations and laws of the jurisdiction concerned, such as the capital management and the foreign exchange mechanism, and also the regulatory requirements for AML and CFT. And thirdly, that is interoperability. Um, the development of CBDC should fully tap the role of existing infrastructure and leverage the FinTech uh, the, so as to enable interoperability between CBDC systems of uh, different jurisdictions, as well as between uh, CBDC system and incumbent payment systems. And the currency conversion will be processed on the virtual border between wallets. So uh, in that case, uh, there's no, uh, you know, uh, the financial risks such as currency substitution, since the domestic CBDC should be converted to the other currencies as payments cross borders uh, to avoid the potential adverse macro uh, macroeconomic implications. So um, that those are the principles that we adopted in the uh, research with the Hong Kong MA uh, about the, uh, the cross-border payment services. Back to you, uh, Alice. Do you, I'll, I'll go to the other panelists on this as well. Do you think it's, it's possible to build a, a CBDC that's interoperable with other CBDCs, tech and works um, across borders without creating some sort of risk of currency substitution? Um, uh, let's go to Gabriella first. Is that possible? Well, this is something that we are currently analyzing within the, the building block 19 that Tobias was uh, mentioning. And it's very much the IMF involved in this analysis in the do no harm at the cross-border level. Um, I would say that um, digital dollarization uh, is mostly... Um, Dollarization in general is mostly a problem of economy that is not, you know, well managed. Um, but uh, you, you you still have the problem, uh, and we need to have also mechanisms here. Chang Chung was mentioning some in order to um, mitigate the risks of um, uh, too large currency flows from one country to another, especially from emerging markets, for example, that are more prone to uh, those risks. Uh, I don't have the silver bullet. This is something that is being analyzed now. Um, but they do no harm. That is the first principle that central banks agreed on um, in the first report that the group of seven central banks and the BIS published in 2020 uh, is the first principle. And uh, it has to also uh, be uh, present at the cross border level uh, to mitigate those risks. Um, Tobias, is, is the IMF the standard setter here for uh, for creating that cross border uh, linkage without uh, without risking currency substitution? 
We are not the standard setter. So our articles of agreement give us certain powers, but certainly not those of a regulator. So we are working with the FSB, which is the regulatory body, uh, in order to uh, make sure that there is interoperability. Let me just point out that interoperability goes far beyond technology, right? So technology is one aspect, but it's really the institutional arrangement around cross-border uh, transactions that is key here. And let me point to two, uh, two uh, different models that are possible. So one is where um, CBDCs in any currency can be held in any country, right? And so uh, there you certainly have a, a, a risk of uh, dollarization or, or CBDCation, uh, but uh, that foreign CBDCation. Um, but of course, the response to that is sound macroeconomic policies, you know, sound institutions, you know, a country like Sweden, for example, is, is, is not too worried about being euroized or so or, or dollarized, right? Because, you know, it has very sound institutions, which is not the case for all countries. There's a second uh, model, which is very different, where uh, foreign CBDC uh, would have to be exchanged through intermediaries. And so you just couldn't hold the foreign CBDC in 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 the foreign in 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 your country, um, and so that uh, re would require very different standards and um, uh, arrangements. And uh, so you know it is it is a work in progress, as uh, Gabriela pointed out. Uh, on dollarization, the first best is is good policies in the in the overall uh, institutions, the macroeconomy, etc. Um, okay, I think I have time for, for one final question, and I'm going to put it to uh, to Cheng Chen. Is digital dollarization something China is uh, acutely worried about, or or do you feel safe that if a, a dollar were introduced, it would not sort of threaten China? Well, I think under the guidance of uh, international uh, setting bodies, we uh, don't uh, actually worry about dollarization in the future. And uh, uh, for example, with the support of the the BS and the MF, and uh, we have already developed the uh, the Enbridge project, and uh, that under that project uh, we can have the uh, uh, all the central banks join in in this multilateral CBDC platform that supports inst instant cross border PVP in multiple currencies among multiple jurisdictions. So uh, with that, uh, uh, international organizations, uh, initiatives, for, for example, like to be as I said, have that ever said the FSB were working on the uh, building block 19 on the CBDC uh, in interoperability issues in terms of the cross-border payment services. So in that, in that scenario, in that support of all the international setting bodies uh, initiatives, we don't actually worry about uh, the uh, the uh, dollarization issue. At the same time, we have very uh, strict, I mean, we have the uh, capital management measures in place. Uh, in, in those, with that measures support, uh, we don't expect any uh, uh, I mean, significant impact of the dollarization uh, impact. Back to you, Alice. Thank you very much uh, for that answer. And a huge thank you to all of my panelists who have joined uh, myself, the Atlanta Council, and the IMF today. Uh, thank you, Tobias, Gabriella, and Cheng Chun. I thought your answers uh, were extremely interesting. I was uh, thrilled to be able to discuss some of those super dynamic questions with you, the idea of financial stability, cross-border uh, currency substitution, and the idea that, you know, economies are digitizing, uh, economies' payment systems are digitizing all the time, and uh, CBDCs are just one part of that. Uh, thank you to everyone who's tuned in. Uh, I'd highly recommend that you go and look at the IMF's uh, paper. In particular, there are four charts of uh, that lay out the various different decisions and choices that uh, different central banks have made to do with the functions of CBDCs, the goals, uh, the technology they're using, um, et cetera, and they're extremely clarifying. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, thank you for having me as well. I'm now going to turn to Josh Lipsky, the director of the Atlantic Council uh, Geoeconomic Center for some concluding remarks.
Thank you. Well, thank you, Alice, for moderating that fascinating conversation. And we covered so much territory and, of course, more to cover. I want to thank Mu Chang Chun, Gabriela Giborg, Tobias Adrian for your thoughtful insights on digital currency this morning and taking time to share with all of us. Thank you to the IMF and the Managing Director for joining us at the Atlantic Council to launch your important new paper. Now, this event was titled Behind the Scenes on Central Bank Digital Currency. And the truth is that there are many people at the Atlantic Council, at the IMF, at the Swedish Riksbank, at the People's Bank of China, that worked tirelessly across many time zones for weeks behind the scenes to make this event possible. So thanks to all of you. And we heard two clear messages today. The first is that over 100 countries are exploring a central bank digital currency. Think of the rapid change from just a few years ago to today. And they are learning from the innovations of the central banks represented here this morning and in the IMF's new research paper. The second thing we heard, and this is equally important, is that very few final decisions have been made. How will the CBDC work with the commercial banking system? Will it use distributed ledger technology or not? Or as we heard, maybe a hybrid? Will it be account or token based or both? Will it interact with stable coins and other private sector options? What about cross border? These decisions will be made in the year and years ahead, but they will shape how the entire world uses money for the decade and decades ahead. And that is why we have made understanding this shift and this transformation a core pillar of our work at the Geoeconomic Center. Next week, we will host a two-day conference with our partners at the University of California, San Diego on digital currency in the Asia Pacific. Next month, we will launch new research on cybersecurity and digital currency. It was brought up today one of the most important challenges facing both policymakers and engineers in the US and around the world. Our goal is to bring voices together, to learn from one another, like I think we did this morning, and help build a financial system that is safer and faster and more inclusive all at the same time. You can register for our events and publications at the link in the chat. Keep an eye out for everything that's coming from the Atlantic Council Geoeconomic Center. Thank you for being part of today's launch. Have a wonderful rest of the day.